Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by the company you depend upon for all of your greatest needs, Heart Life. These stories are true dramatizations from our fair city's glorious history. So listen and remember, Heart Life, all the life you'll ever need. Deep beneath the rising beacon of the Heart Life building, in the darkest recesses of the darkest tunnels, one finds the hideouts, lairs, and dens of residents with nefarious purposes. Amongst the entrances of these dark nooks and decrepit holes in the wall, one stands out. Perhaps this is because its occupant has removed every single piece of surveillance equipment. Perhaps... It is because its door is a solid piece of wrought iron, with a large knocker held within the image of a human's dead, gaping mouth. More likely, it is because the person who lives there put out a lovely little welcome mat with flowers on it. Upon entering this particular domicile, after wiping our feet, we find Dr. Herbert West deep in thought after his fruitless meeting with Dr. Caligari. He turns to his lab table and speaks. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Ladies, gentlemen, parts and combinations thereof, what can I say? Am I surprised? How can one be surprised by something one has experienced over and over again? Disappointed? I had hoped this time would be different, had hoped this place, like few others, would be filled with open-minded people, dedicated to the free exploration of science, who were not, well, really quite mean. Is it fate that I am so hounded? Is it my destiny to be constantly faced with the adverse and ignorant? What could I have possibly done in my perversion of the laws of nature to be cursed as I am? If it weren't for my firm scientific certainty that these are merely a series of random unrelated coincidences, I would wonder such things. Then again... If I did not face such resistance, would I still be me? What if my parents had never grounded me for incorporating the dog and the cat? Herbert Humilicus West, what have you done this time? What if I hadn't been expelled from my first city after my amorphous blob creation consumed my entire fourth grade? What if I didn't do everything humanly, and somewhat inhumanly, possible to give my patients a new lease on... uh, Let's call it life. Oh, certainly. There have been some setbacks. Bumps on the road. The cat and the dog never really got along. A patient or two might have reverted into hulking preternatural forms that absorbed those they touched. And Albuquerque... But that is science. There are no guarantees, no certainty. It is trial and error, informed guesswork. If you aren't constantly in danger of obliterating everything you know, you aren't really doing science. And the one person, the one person I meet in this city who I think might understand is rude. Genius is no excuse to be unmannered. Gentle invitations, please and thank you. Sharing. Especially sharing. I mastered sharing when I was three. Mr. West, did you bring enough conjoined dog cat for the entire class? No, but with a little improvised surgery, there could be plenty to go around. But no. She's just like everyone else in this place. She has to threaten and plan and be master of all, as if such a thing were possible. Facing her problems by killing them, 
without class or finesse. She may as well be wearing a lab coat and injecting people with rat flu. There is, of course, another way. A way to demonstrate the futility of trying to conquer the natural world and reveal to her the glory and unending explorations that is true science. A way she herself, in her arrogance, unintentionally provided for in the form of this containment tube. A failure that shall lead her to further discoveries. How very scientific. This is why I have brought you all here, parts of ladies and gentlemen. Today, I am going to need one of you to help me push the frontiers of science once more. The decision has been a difficult one. I just want to say that you are all really great, and I wish I could reanimate each and every one of you. Unfortunately, I just don't have enough containment tubes containing the spark of life to do that at this time. For now, only one of you will do. And that one is... Thank you, Andrew. The lucky reanimatee is... Jane Doe, number 753. Oh, come now. Don't be like that. Give her a hand. Thank you, Andrew. Now, my dear... Say goodbye to your friends and join me in the wonderful world where life becomes death and death becomes not death. I I didn't really think that line through. I'll work on that. Anyway, up you go. Here we are. The place where the magic happens. But not really. Magic was really a metaphor for science. Because the science I am to perform is so advanced to the untrained eye, it might appear to be magic. But it's not. It's science. Magic doesn't exist. I ramble when I get excited. I hope you don't mind. It's a fairly simple three-step process. The first involves the reanimation elixir, a cocktail of chemicals designed to stimulate your medulla, which will be injected into your hindbrain. Now... I am sure you would like to know the contents of the reanimation elixir. And well, you should. Always know what's going into your body. You have that right. Remember that. Sadly, you wouldn't understand it. And not just because you're dead. Many of the chemicals are my own design, made from the rarest elements and objects one can find. My own secret recipe, if you will. We'll just open the tube... Add this to the mixture. Stir briskly for five seconds. Voila! You have an elixir the dead will rise for. We just load it all into the syringe. If you have a problem with needles, it may be best to look away. On the count of three. Ready? One, two, I'm just kidding. It's already done. See? That wasn't so bad, now was it? Here, have a sucker. Once you've marinated a bit, we'll irradiate your brain to ionize the formula, then use an electric shock to catalyze the biomechanical reaction until it cascades into brain function. Andrew? Yes, Master. (coughs) I mean, yes, Master? How many times must I tell you... Science is egalitarian. There are no masters. Please, call me Herbert. That doesn't really seem right to me. Can I just call you Dr. West instead? If you must. Andrew, please prepare the irradiation chamber. The what? The irradiation chamber. Uh, the one I asked you to borrow from Emily's lab. It was on the list. Yeah, about that, I I sort of lost the list. You lost it. I dropped it. You dropped it. While running away. While running away. What on earth from? Dr. Caligari? I was doing just like you said, gathering up all the equipment on the list. Then, I heard the doctor coming out of her paralysis. 
Dr. Caligari was staggering towards me, uh, moaning and wailing like she wanted to... Don't tell me. Eat your brains. Use the bathroom. Ah. Ah, yes. Well, she does have her priorities. Well, there's no avoiding it, then. We'll have to go back. But won't she... Mind? Certainly. Try to kill us? Undoubtedly. But we do need that equipment. Radioactive material does not grow on radioactive trees, after all. Well, with luck, she'll have stepped out for the evening and we can work unhindered. If not, well, bring some rope. Come along, Andrew. If you would take up Miss Doe 753, she mustn't be late, after all. This is her life. Uh, come along, Miss Doe uh, Five. Doctor West, I don't like talking to dead people. You must get used to it. All right. Come here, Doctor West. Wait up. You know she looks awfully familiar. And so the intrepid Dr. West and the far less intrepid Andrew Snidge make their way toward the lair of the sinister and mysterious Dr. Caligari. What will they find there? Will they succeed in their task? Why does Jane Doe 753 seem so familiar? These questions will be answered next week in She's Alive.